I think you said the key word, team. That um, had a hard time for the last 12 plus months, more than that, I guess, in the concept of team and what it takes to be a good one. And every day we seem to find new ways to tighten those bonds and make us one. And the fact that we're doing that gives us a greater opportunity to win. Uh, I heard someone coach say that th his team today is game ready. That would scare the hell out of me if I was thought our team was game ready today. And you know, we still have way too much time in between now and then. We need to build towards that. I can say for certainty we are better off, way better off than we were a year ago at this time. But we're not ready to play a game yet. We're not. How's your uh, quarterback situation going right now? Man, that didn't take long, did it? <laughs> it uh, it's still happening. And uh, I, I, Coach Gottlieb, Mike Gottlieb, baseball coach, been here probably longer than I've been alive. That guy recruited me as a baseball player. <clears throat> Asked me all the time who's going to be the starting quarterback and gets really annoyed that he forgets I answer him in the same vein every time. It's the guy who takes the snaps. Uh, the good news is, is the play out of the two front runners has increased immensely it, to, to the point where it's not the coaches that are happy, it's the players. So uh, I'm confident that whoever we start on the first game is uh, going to put up a better showing than what we put on the field last year. But as to who that guy is, we're not there yet. Relatively easy, if you paid really close attention to our schematics over the years, we do it already. We've done it in the past, but instead of having a complete diet of it, it was sporadic. Now we're mixing more odd as the foundation and even as the sporadic. And it'll be a challenge for everybody, but schematically we're set up both in terminology and scheme to be able to switch all the time. Uh, we've taken what we called our Tiger Accountability Program and kind of injected it with some legal steroids and nutrition nutritional elements to make it a lot bigger and instead of just doing it in the spring like we normally do it's carried over into the summer where we've come up with three core values for leadership and that they're how how just not only to lead but how to follow and you, th you think about some of these kids the world that we live in is so me and so individualized that actually following somebody who's worth following is a new concept for some of these kids so not only do we have to teach leadership we have to teach fellowship and appropriate fellowship so uh, we have not only a leadership council, but we have a hierarchy. And we have, uh, I guess I can let the dog out of the bag. We have six kings, and they are, the, they are the leaders. They are the guys that have proven themselves on and off the field to hold to the core values of the institution and the football team. Uh, and underneath of them, we have the Sentinel Warriors that keep watch over all things that is Towson football. And then we have the soldiers that you cannot live without underneath. And it's a, it's a cross between military history and medieval times. And then underneath of that, you got the fun stuff. You got the first year guys, you can call them greenies, slaps, jags, whatever you want. But you got to work your way up. And there's rewards for, for being each and every one of those working your way to that level and to the point where there can only be six kings. The only way that a king could lose his seat is to be unseated and that to be not worthy of being king. And... Uh, it's the kids have taken to it. The responsibilities have grown, and because of it, they're tighter. They follow each other. They do. I don't say stuff. They say stuff. And I said this for the guys that have followed us for a long period of time and our successes. It means more when it's theirs. They'll do what I say. It's my program, but it's their team. And when they take when they take ownership of it, you've seen really really good things happen. And I see that starting to take place now. We've had to do some things to get to that place, but I like where we're going. Who are, huh? Who are the six kings? Who are the six kings? Connor Frazier, Darius Victor, John Desir, Brighton Barr, and Emmanuel Holder. That's five. That's five. And hold on, I gotta go around the room. Eric Handy. Eric Handy, which they called him the king before we ever. <laughs> hey, you watch when you get him today. Ask him why they call him the king. And it was long before we came up with this. Well, it's fun to watch. Uh, you know, if anybody who's watched Brighton Bar play football, uh, he brings a level of enthusiasm for the game and this team that uh, not many people have. He's just an excitable dude, and if you put a helmet on him, it's really like pl plug plugging the Energizer Bunny in with too much energy. He just goes nuts. But now he's older, he's wiser, and he's a guy who loves the game and has had the game taken away from him for a considerable amount of time. Talk about somebody being appreciative of their opportunities. And 
his brains, his leadership, and that appreciation for his opportunity to be a Towson football player is something that's contagious and rubs off on everybody else. It is great to have him back in the helmet. Uh, it was 257 days from the, the Rhode Island game to the first day of camp. And I distinctly recall not having enough bodies to suit up and play at the offensive line position. That's a hard thing for those kids to go through. It's a hard thing for the team to go through. And we go through a year where guys got beat up. You know, the offensive line changed almost every week. I think we might have gone two weeks in a row where we actually had some continuity and had some success because of it, but it was so rare because they were young and beat up. But now you got a locker room full of guys that have been to war. Uh, you know, they say they've, they've been to the carnival, they've seen the puppet show, they know the strings, they know what's real, what's not. But more importantly, they had a chance to have a mirror put right in front of their face and go, this is what I was, this wasn't good enough, and six to eight months to find a way to get better. You look at our guys, they're all bigger, they're all stronger, and each and every one of them has more experience. Uh, I'd probably say experience, I'm not going to, you know, not successful experience, but experience. They'd be hard pressed to find a Division One school in America that has as many offensive linemen that have the experience that our guys have. And I'm going to guess that this year that's probably going to turn into something pretty good. Tremendously talented. Uh, that, that's another kid that he can just go. Loves football, loves to hit. And to, uh, truth be told, he's a little weird, which you got to be if you're going to be a linebacker. There's no normal human beings to play linebacker. So I like the fact that he's a little odd. But he's still young, he's still green, he's still light. Um, he has issues with keeping weight on. And uh, with a guy with high metabolism like he does, that's, that's something that spending a lifetime of living off a of talent and not realizing that you're gonna go beat up against 220 pound tailbacks or uh, 300 pound linemen, it's hard to do for a long period of time. And he's still growing in that vein, learning how to adjust his body, eat right, sleep right, prepare right. So uh, talented but young with high expectations. It's big, you know, as we talked at the end of the season, you know, he, he earned the right to be the Mike linebacker for the year last year. But it wasn't the most impressive showing in the world. And he too, like some of those offensive linemen, got to look at this is what I thought I was, this is what I was against competition. And he probably, in our team, he probably had, and I'm, I'm being overrest, I don't know, it's a broad statement, but he's probably the top 10 guys for off seasons this year that from January to today he's worked his butt off he is faster he is stronger and he has earned the respect of the players in a degree that comes from work not just showing up for work does going from the 4-3 to 3-4 require much of an adjustment for him not really now, those two interior guys are it's it's almost the same the calls are the same it's just how we get there's a little bit different and, he, and he's, a, and it should be said, Eric's an extremely intelligent person. The reason that he is in that position at the age that he was is because he's so smart. I think a long time ago that, uh, who things were rough. It was, things were rough all over. But now I sit there, and I'll, especially it brings to mind yesterday's one-on-ones with the wideouts and the DBs. And I'm looking at multiple guys on both sides of the ball that are sub four or five. Uh, guys with size, strength. And even in the case of these transfers and stuff, experience. Uh, that alone was worth the price of admission just yesterday. And that's our every day. So with, with higher competition on a regular level, it allows you to play faster come game day as a group. And uh, I, you, know, you guys hung out with me a little bit last year. And I tried to put on a smiley face. I'm smiling more these days. Uh, uh, both extremely talented, both extremely physical, which I had an idea they might be, but when you step up to the next level and you start playing against I mean, we got a guy named Christian Summers who's 6'2", 220, and he's a bull with great hands, and he's not afraid of anybody, and these kids aren't afraid of him. So the, the, that competition is physically stiff. Um, I'm not going to make any statements about, you know, where they're going to end their careers and potentially. Those are two really, really, really. How long? How many reallys am I allowed to say that you're gonna stop printing? Really, really, really. Dot, dot, dot. Really good corners. Practicing faster. I would say that, and is trying to explain this to the kids. And, and you got to go back a couple of years before we played Maryland. I told them, look, we're just as fast as they are, just as strong as they are. We might give up an inch or two at a couple of positions, but other than that, you put 11 guys on the field. Our 11 are almost as good as their 11, or in some cases, better. 
trying to educate these kids at the difference between the 1A game and a 1A one, one, one team and a 1AA team. The only real difference is consistent team speed in practice, that they're used to functioning at a higher level longer. So, you know, head to head, your, your best 11 and their best 11 should be pretty close if you can get your guys to play at that speed. And once I said that, these guys have taken to it faster than we did in previous years. You guys have covered us before we had a chance to go down there and beat Maryland. We didn't have enough guys that actually believed we could do it. And after that game, we believed we could play with anybody in the country. Well, all those guys are gone. Now we're going to sit here and go line up against East Carolina. It's a really, really good football team, one of the top ten offenses in America last year. And uh, our guys are starting to develop the confidence in themselves that if we practice at that high tempo, just like a 118 does, that we'll have a chance to compete with not only East Carolina, but everybody in the country. Sure. Uh, he's smaller, but shorter, not smaller, I'm sorry, which means his center of gravity is lower, which makes him harder to tackle. You guys have heard me say this before. I'm a huge fan of Walter Payton. I grew up, I was born in Chicago. Walter Payton's the guy who coined the phrase violent sideline running, where if you were going to hit him, he was going to hit you and make you pay for hitting him. Darius Victor is the only person I've ever met in my life who ran a football and knocked out two opposing players in the same game. Terrence was tough to tackle, but he never did that. And I'll, truth be told, Vito's a better pass blocker. He's better in scheme, and he's physically better. I think he's one of the few players that I've ever seen, coached, or played against that I really would not want to hit or get hit by. He is a leader. He is a leader. But he's, he's a respected leader because of what he's done. And it's not just what he's done on the football field. Uh, pound for pound, he's probably the strongest human being we have on the football team. And uh, there, there's no aspect of our preparation that he thinks he's too good for. That the team comes first. And truth be told, he doesn't really care about, care about stats. You know, Markel Dickerson is a talented young true sophomore, and the two of them are a solid one-two punch. And you would think that the two of them would be fighting each other for reps, and they're not. When one guy has a great run, his biggest cheerleader is the other one. Now, when you got two talented backs like that that are that unselfish, you got a chance to have a pretty good offense.